This is the Ghent altarpiece by Jan van Eyck, which is an incredibly impressive picture. It was incredibly influential when it was uh, first painted at the beginning of the 15th century. Uh, if you ever get to Ghent in Belgium, you should go see it. It's a polyptych, and when you close it, you see on the middle, uh, on the right-hand side, this scene of the Annunciation, where behind the Virgin Mary, there's a book, a book that you see here. Well, there's not a book, there's a painting of a book. We're talking about an area of the painting that's about three inches high, and uh, art historians were wondering whether uh, Van Eyck, who is known to be a great um, uh, perfectionist, had pushed his perfectionism so far as to actually really paint a text. I mean, a real text, rather than the little vertical and horizontal marks that might give that illusion. Uh, we have, oh, there the slide is. Okay, so uh, if you show me a book like that in a, uh, a museum, I can't read it because these medieval, this medieval lettering, the Litera Formata, are very hard to read for a non-specialist. But specialists couldn't read it on this painting either. And that's because you see all these cracks. The craquelure on this painting that's over 600 years old uh, makes it very hard to distinguish where you have real letters, which are worn a bit, and where the cracks. And so most art historians said, well, it's not a real text, come on. But uh, I, one of the fields in which I work is using building mathematical tools for image analysis, and so when I heard of this, I said, well, maybe we can try to find algorithms that find these cracks automatically, and then once we've marked them, can inpaint them. And if I had known how hard a task that was, I might have kept my mouth, but uh, <laughs> it turned out it was very challenging, and, uh, but we did solve it. It became part of a PhD thesis of a student in electrical engineering in Brussels, and together with researchers at Ghent, we published a paper in which this solution was uh, published. And we went from the craquelure on, on, on the right here to the text on the, on, uh, on the left to the text on the right. And well, when I first saw the results, I said, well, fat lot of good that has done to us. I mean, I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't read anything. But specialists said, oh my god, look at this. And they could very clearly recognized 12 groups of words, which not only established beyond a doubt that Van Eyck really had painted the text, but they found that, in fact, they could identify what text. It was a page of a manuscript that had been copied a few decades earlier in Rouge, and that was a text by Thomas of Aquinas on the Annunciation, in an Annunciation painting scene. So they were absolutely delighted, and uh, there was uh, this, was, was, uh, this made a very nice article in art history. Um, I wanted to start my uh, the story today with that, to tell you that even prior to my main uh, topic today, we had learned how to recognize and find and in-paint cracks in paintings. So my story is about an art exhibit that is going on right now in the Nas North Carolina Museum of Art in Raleigh. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, I recommend it highly. Its last day is tomorrow, so <laughs> you don't have a lot of time. So this was really something in which uh, we sailed uncharted waters, and let me show you how. So it all started because uh, 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 an altarpiece that uh, dates back to the 14th century uh, from a small church in the Marche region in Italy had been broken up at, in the early 20th century and sold to collectors. Three of those panels are in the North Carolina Museum of Art collection. One is in Portland. Three are in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. One is in Chicago. And the very last one, well, the very last one is missing. Uh, art uh, uh, conservators, after they realized, now curators, that these panels belong to the same altarpiece, have looked everywhere, but they haven't found this panel. They had this dream of bringing all the panels together uh, here in North Carolina. The other museum said, yes, yes, but you won't still have it complete. And uh, I, fortunately, I, I happen to know a very gifted artist, but also an art conservator and art reconstruction expert, uh, Charlotte Kaspers, who they then commissioned to paint uh, a, a reconstruction of this missing painting. She does this mostly for museums, 
for educational purposes. Here's an example of something she made for a museum in Rotterdam. So it's a little bit, a portion of a painting they have that she reconstructed. And for this educational piece, she stopped a quarter inch short with every layer of preparation. And so you see, she's already four months into working on this panel before she even starts painting. All the different layers of sizing, of gesso, and uh, drawing, and gilding, and so on. Um, so they commissioned a, uh, a panel for her for this missing uh, uh, painting. And uh, well, you could ask yourself, how do I do that on a painting? I mean, I don't have the panel. How do I reconstruct? Well, the seven panels, the seven small panels that existed, reconstructed the uh, followed episodes, mark uh, important episodes of the life of uh, John the Evangelist, as it was described literally in uh, this medieval best bestseller, The Golden Legend. Uh, 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 in which lives of saints are recounted. And we know it's a bestseller because of many medieval books we have only maybe part of a copy or something, and this of, of this we have hundreds. So uh, everybody wanted one. So they knew what scene had to be depicted, and then they made a composition of a scene that borrowed lots of stylistic elements of the other panels, so as not to invent something that would not have been appropriate. Now, if they ever find a ninth panel, it's not going to look identical to this, but it's highly likely in this style. And then, uh, here you see the build-up of the panel, just like you saw the layers on, on, on the, you see it being uh, gilded and polished, and then paint is going to come in uh, if, if my clicker keeps working, uh, and uh, the, the verdaccio on the faces, uh, the different paint layers, and as they uh, get uh, modeled more, and the final result is absolutely fantastic. And you can see that final new panel with a documentary uh, of how the panel was made at the museum. And uh, you see differences. I mean, on old panels where you have these punch marks that have been uh, knocked into the gilding, they have, over all the, the 600 years since the painting was made, been filled with, they've, they've gradually filled with dirt and they now show like a dark relief. But originally, on these polished, on this polished gold, they gave you the reflections and so on, and with the candles in the church, they would have given you a, a sparkling halo around the head of the saint. So you can all see that on the, the new panel. And so people, the, the curators and the conservators, were so happy with this whole experience and how educational it would be, and there's this glorious new painting. But then they realized that they couldn't put it next to the other panels because everybody would have eyes only for this new one, this new bright, shiny one. And it would be the only one that was not authentic. So uh, I then said, well, I always say that. Math can help. Uh, because what we could do is we could study the uh, uh, panels and the old panels and the new panels. And we could, on the one hand, find a correspondence of color between the two different types of panels and change color. We could use that to virtually age the new painting. And in fact, when you go to the museum, you see this virtually aged one, a printout of that exposed next to the other panels. But we could also, if we learned all about that, we could rejuvenate the old panels. And that's what we did. So, the craquelure, well, you've seen, we can find craquelure and we can paint it in. So we did that. Here you see how we do indeed find the, all the red markings is the automatically found cracks. And we, uh, uh, once we did that, we can inpaint. You see an example here. We did that very gradually with an iterative algorithm that you see here gradually progressing. It was very important to us to not produce just a chromo I mean, we wanted to use scholarly uh, grounded methods in order to make this transition. So we never took it to places where you didn't have evidence for how it should have been. And if we didn't do a perfect job, well, so be it. I mean, uh, but uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't impose our vision. So here you have the background of one of those paintings and then the cracks removed. Then we could color remap. So here you have the eighth authentic panel, the old panel, and the background of the ninth new panel. And because the compositions were borrowed from each other, we knew exactly uh, uh, how the pigments that were new now 
looked after all their aging, and we could use that in order to do color remapping for these paintings. So we, here you see the color remapping for the old uh, 14th century painting on the left and remapped to new colors on the right. Here you see the next one, uh, the new one on the right, color remapped to the old version on the left. And then, of course, to make a, vir a virtual aged version, we had to put in cracks, and then we had to add the gold, and that is now what is in, 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 in the museum. And I hope some of you get a chance to see it tomorrow. It's not expensive by Uber to get to, North Carolina, to, 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 to NCMA. <laughs> Um, so it's absolutely gorgeous to see all those paintings together. Um, you, uh, uh, so this whole uh, uh, effort of the rejuvenation and the aging was done with the Bass Connections group, with undergraduates here at Duke, uh, and we had a ball. And uh, of course, we had a lot of help also from Charlotte Caspers, who gave us advice on the colors. Uh, but you see, the uh, uh, reconstruction of that ninth panel was uncharted waters for the art conservators and art curators. They had never done something like that and they really enjoyed the experience. And then the whole remapping and, and crack uh, removal and so on was uh, an, an exhilarating experience also. Uh, for us, it was no longer a research project because we had learned to do that research earlier on the altarpiece of Ghent. But it turned out there were uncharted waters for the mathematicians as well because uh, we came up to a new un, 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 uh, problem. We got to work with Platypus. Platypus uh, uh, is a software package that we put together and that saw uh, uh, it's that, 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 came, uh, uh, that came to life because of, of the Gissi panel. Because in preparing for the work on the Gissi panel, uh, I asked to see the x-rays. And when they showed me the x-rays, here you see an, a detail and the x-ray, I said, what's this nonsense? It looks like it's behind prison bars. I mean, isn't that annoying to you? And the conservator said, Noel Ocon said, yes, it is annoying. And it's the cradle. I said, the cradle? Well, cradling is something that you see on many uh, paintings on wood panel. Here you see a detail of the altarpiece of Ghent. It's also cradled. And the cradling uh, is a, a hardwood structure of uh, a lattice structure that's attached to the back of these panels. These panels were originally about an inch thick, and they would kind of work and warp with temperature changes. And when collectors bought them from the churches, they preferred something that was flatter. They also, in some cases, wanted to remove uh, uh, wood uh, uh, worm damage or, or, uh, or other damage, but in many cases, it was just to flatten it. And so they made them much thinner and then gave them structural in 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 integrity with this cradle. And so this cradle would be attached to the back of it uh, uh, with, with big uh, uh, fixed members and then sliding members. The sliding members slid probably in the first few years and then after that the wood had worked so much that it, they were rock fast. Um, but when you x-ray something like that, of course, all you see is cradle. I mean, and so all the subtle brushwork that you use the x-rays for or the subtle details of conservation are swamped out by that big difference. And so when I heard about this, I said, well, maybe math can help. So, uh, uh, and, uh, but it was a very challenging problem because not only, it wasn't so hard to find the location of those cradle members and the first part of our algorithm does that and it can be assisted if it's a little bit difficult by uh, uh, actually by the, by the art conservator. But the, the, the more interesting thing is that after you've removed that uh, wood structure, you actually still have a lot of wood grain from that cradle sitting there, as you can see here on the right. Uh, and the, I mean, by then, uh, we, we had become heroes for the art conservators, so they said, Would you, could you, could you please take the wood grain away of the cradle? But we want to keep the wood grain of the panel. I said, sure, really? And uh, I said, but maybe we can. And it turned out it was very challenging. I mean, uh, uh, so here you have on, on the left a piece of a gissi, and on the right, the, 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 uh, we have removed the intensity, but the wood grain is still there. And on the left, the wood grain is gone. 
So how did we do that? Well, we knew, of course, where the different cradle members had been. And so we used machine learning techniques to isolate, first of all, what wood grain was, and then to find where uh, the uh, 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 different uh, uh, wood grain, uh, what the nature was of the wood grain, where you only had panel or panel plus cradle and so on. And then we could remove it. And that was a part of, of, of the, the, the graduate work of one of my graduate students. And uh, we were very proud. And so it's now used. This is for a piece of, of Van Eyck. Uh, here you see a piece of the Prado in which we actually can compare with, because that was a case where they removed the, 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 the cradle structure by hand because it was causing damage to the painting. And you can see that uh, uh, we are actually uh, much closer to the ground truth with Platypus the name of the software, than with uh, what, what, what people could do before. So this was done with collaboration of art conservators, art curators, and uh, students and uh, uh, postdocs. And Platypus has learned to uh, leave its cradle. And if everything goes well with the presentation, then we now can see uh, the movie that uh, uh, is the rejuvenated panel of the, uh, uh, the, the GC. So thank you very much.